under the table. You know that under the table. No, I'm not. Bianca's selling them. I just have them under the table so I can sign them for people. Um, Actually, Dr. Fry heard that one. <laughs> so I'm going to read a section, a uh, chapter from this book, which is called School Days, which is about high school in New York City. But before I do that, because <coughs> Valerie Fisher is here, I want to show you the illustration she made for a chapter that's called Shoe Stories, um, which I absolutely adore. And um, thank you, Valerie. And I also want to show you the illustration that my daughter, Anya Cutler, made for... Huh? I think it's on page 50. You just passed it. <laughs> I think it's on page 50. I think it is. For a chapter called Audrey and Me, which is about the models of the 50s. <laughs> and this chapter is called School Days, and that's a picture of me wearing my belt from Ye Oldy Village Treasure Shoppy which comes up in the chapter. What page is that? Uh, 59. Thank you. Okay, school days. <clears throat> Those who didn't go to high school in New York City in the 50s have never tasted the sweetness of life before the revolution. <laughs> For them, bunny hops, guys with greased duck tails, the a cappella quartets doo-wopping on street corners, or the innocent consumption of hugely caloric banana splits must remain something they saw in Greece. I was lucky enough to have been there. But even the sweetness of life before the revolution could be contaminated by having to wear a gym suit. <laughs> a one-piece garment, the gym suit, had stiff, bulky, short sleeves, out of which your arms, no matter how beautifully muscled or voluptuous, emerged like pipe cleaners. <laughs> the style chosen at Forest Hills High School snapped down the front and had a built-in belt with a metal buckle through which you could never thread the other belt end, although our implacable gym instructors demanded that we turn up buckled. The bottom of this repulsive garment had a bloomer-like inner brief attached at the waist with elastic bands that gathered the stiff fabric around the thigh. Then, cuffs like trouser cuffs were sewn over the gathers. I suppose the idea was to make the bottoms look like shorts, but keep active girls modest by means of elastic. <laughs> the suits were made in a number of colors, daffodil, tropic green, white, sea foam, and Rio red. <laughs> At Forest Hills, ours were a dusty royal blue, swing blue. Humans must have mixed these colors <coughs> and invented the names for them. Other humans thought up the way these outfits should look, but no human girl would willingly put one on her body. As we had to endure gym three times a week, the hours we spent in gym suits represented a sizable chunk of school time. On Fridays, we were supposed to take them home to be washed and ironed. <coughs> If they seemed improperly starched and pressed on Mondays, Miss Creighton would give you a demerit. I was an unbelievably proficient ironer, having spent many hours the summer before I went to Forest Hills, bent over the ironing board, meditating on how to press the complicated pleats of certain summer skirts I loved to wear. But I resented having to iron the gym suit, and actually it looked a little less hideous, rumpled, and soggy. The torture of dressing for gym didn't end with the suit. We also had to present ourselves in perfectly pristine white sneakers, never mind how we kept them that way. Chalk is the method I seem to remember. And the ubiquitous bobby socks. Any girl, no matter how beautiful, could put on her swing blue suit and be transformed instantly into a pudding on legs. <laughs> the really sharp, popular girls would belt themselves in tightly to show their waists, roll up their sleeves as far as they could go, leave the top snaps down the front undone, and attempt to tuck the fake cuffs into the elastic around the thighs. On the principle, that if more of themselves could be displayed, they would look better. <laughs> but 
There is truly no way to improve one's appearance. A gym suit acted like a sponge, drawing all eyes and attention to itself. Dressed in a royal blue one-piece, you didn't dare look at the boys exercising in another part of the gym or out on the so-called fields overlooking Grand Central Parkway. And while they might have looked at you, a more potent antidote to surging hormones could hardly have been thought of. A gym suit was more damaging to teen libido than a dose of saltpeter, and 17 times as ugly. No matter what quantity of washing and ironing was lavished on them, gym suits reeked of the gym, an amalgam of sweat and metal with an undertone of decay. Three times a week, we found ourselves enveloped in this aura, writhing calisthenically under the narrowed eyes of red-faced Miss Creighton as she belted out the commands for the performance of sit-ups and jumping jacks. The gym, with its polished wood floors, sickly yellow brick walls, and gothic chicken-wired windows, was a fittingly dour backdrop for our suffering. <laughs> Flitting about among us as we exercised were the gym leaders, a vision of loveliness and in their infinitely more graceful white one-piece skirted suits, complete with little white gathered under briefs. In order to get a white outfit, you had to belong to the leaders club, which would only happen if Miss Creighton nominated you for excellence in gym. <laughs> In the ordinary way of things, I could have forgotten about ever earning a white suit. Miss Creighton hated me, and the feeling was mutual. But through some freakish quirk, I turned out to have an impossible to return serve in volleyball. <laughs> when I entered Forest Hills, we were still forced to play according to an antediluvian method known as girls' rules. You had to hit the ball twice each time, or you'd be disqualified which made for a very slow and almost genteel game. You served by throwing the ball up and then hitting it with your wrist. If I emptied my mind of everything and concentrated on hitting the ball as hard as I possibly could, it would rise just enough to clear the net and fall to the ground on the other side. <laughs> my performance in the rest of any game left a great deal to be desired, but I always found myself on a winning team, and my serve was said to have somehow done the trick. Thus it was that I earned my whites and became one of those acolytes tending the flame of phys ed. <laughs> no longer a putting on legs by virtue of possessing a sassy white skirt and cute white bloomers, I could lord it over those who in the rest of the day looked me over casually and placed me with their eyes where I belonged, in the nerd heap. <laughs> I couldn't help resenting it when my beautiful and well-kitted out classmates look, looked me over or overlooked me, but I definitely fit anyone's definition of nerd. Forced to share a room with my much younger brother, I crept into our huge walk-in closet every night with the novels my favorite English teacher, Mr. Cagle, had recommended. I'd close the door and turn on the light Sitting on the floor under the rustling garments that smelled like my mother, I'd follow Raskolnikov or Ishmael into another world. Weekends, I haunted the Greenwich Village cafes or the Donnell Library on 53rd Street in Manhattan, where I spent hours listening to my first dose of jazz and Welsh folk songs or reading about Indonesian dance. I was one of those who needed a shopping cart to take books out of the library and who read every one of them. Clearly, such bookish habits could only add to my social problems, <laughs> and did add. I can't say that I looked forward to gym exactly, but it remained over the years the only moment in any day at Forest Hills High School for which I was dressed completely correctly, according to the standards of the popular and fashionable. Pitiful and pathetic though it was, the white leader's suit represented the pinnacle of my fashion success. <laughs> the rest of my high school struggles with fashion and image tumbled me downhill from there. It's a matter of common knowledge that everyone is miserable in high school, and I was certainly no different. 
I look around me almost every day and realize that I stuck out like a sore thumb in my white button-down shirts, those cotton skirts I had so laboriously ironed, and a belt from me oldie village treasure shoppy in Greenwich Village. In retrospect, I say it was a good look for me, emphasizing as it did my small waist, my swelling breasts and hips. The problem was that I couldn't pass for popular at Forest Hills High School. That required a different way of dressing. One reason I couldn't pass had to do with what it would have cost to dress properly and what funds I had available to me. The Goldberg family was broke, a fairly constant state for us throughout my high school years. Seal, that's my mother, remained a communist Yes, a real communist, a card-carrying communist, okay? Uh, although even communism with its glossy strictures about what its women should wear couldn't keep Seal herself from dressing well in a very non-communistic way. <laughs> However, she certainly wasn't going to be buying expensive clothing for me so that I could keep up with the Joneses. For one thing, she didn't want me to believe such expenditures were either morally right or possible. For another, she could justify her own extravagant purchases only on the grounds that she wasn't growing, which couldn't be said about me. I knew I couldn't expect little cashmere sweaters and glowing pastel colors, nor did I entertain any hope that somehow I'd magically be decked out in gold charm bracelets. We were, as it happened, a culture of silver wearers. Very nice Mexican silver at that. Seal would have told me if I'd asked that gold was a bourgeois metal, but I never did ask. I already knew what she would say. The mid-50s were anyway a strange time for high school fashion, or so it seems to me now, looking back on an impossibly distant past. Women did not yet wear pants. One of Forest Hills High's assistant principals sent me home one morning because I'd had the audacity to wear a pair under my skirt on a sub-zero day. She accorded me a huge number of demerits and dismissed me before I set foot in the school building where I planned to take off the pants. I had no ex explanation or justification that would propitiate her. Pants were simply not warm. What women did wear was an odd and rather ugly assortment of clothing tight sheep skirts of flannel down to the mid-calf. You had to hobble. Tight cardigan sweaters buttoned up the back, worn with demure little collars you purchased separately and added, and saddle shoes or penny loafers into which you stuffed your <laughs> thick ankle-concealing bobby socks. Over this assemblage you wore, if you had one and <coughs> owned one, your boyfriend's athletic sweater with the letter, <laughs> or his athletic jacket with the letter and the leather sleeves. Around your neck, you twined a pearl heart on a gold chain that your boyfriend had given you. Full circle felt skirts came in and went out on the margins of high school fashion, often worn with a froth of stiff horsehair crinolines and even real hoop skirts. I had none of the hobble skirts. I detested all pastel colors, and my mother had banned penny loafers. No boyfriend materialized. <laughs> if one had, surely he would have been a nerd like me, and therefore team sweaterless. <laughs> and so I found myself marooned among beautiful young girls dressed according to the dictates of fashion while I and my terribly wrong choices of garments tight belts and all, epitomize the nerd in the eyes of these superior beings. I was helplessly wrong for my surroundings, except on the gym floor. Of course I did love clothes, but the ones I happened to love were full skirts, black tights, and black turtlenecks, the complete bohemian rig. It was easier for me to obtain such articles because they were less expensive than those I was supposed to desire. I had another fashion sensibility to which I was trying to conform. My cohort didn't strut the halls of Forest Hills High School. They sat and smoked cigarettes in the Cafe Figaro on McDougall Street in Greenwich Village. 
I wasn't a full-fledged bohemian yet, <clears throat> although I had sneakily smoked plenty of Seal's Camel cigarettes one by one over the years. I didn't have the guts to buy my own cigarettes and smoke them. I wore the right clothes for the Café Figaro, but I wasn't exactly the right shape. Beatnik women tended to be straight and thin, but I was far enough along to keep sitting in the cafes, poring over Henry Miller and drinking endless cups of bitter coffee. On occasion, <clears throat> even I could shine as a fashion plate in a less bohemian environment. For one intoxicating year, the stiffened petticoat known as a horsehair crinoline was cheap, and so I could be as au courant in the matter of extravagantly bouffant underskirts. Often I wore them in pairs under my darkly striped world skirts. One crinoline, <coughs> one crinoline did not give a satisfactory poof to a skirt. After much badgering of seal, I obtained a felt skirt, charcoal gray with pink buttons and belt. I wore it with the two horsehair crinolines and a real hoop skirt. I'm sure I looked weird as hell, a Jewish southern belle in saddle shoes. <laughs> but I felt wonderful, and my gear was remarked upon. Perhaps it was this outfit that helped me get tapped by one of the sororities around which much high school suit high school social life was conducted. I suppose being tapped by Sigma Sigma, or whatever its name was, became one of those defining moments in a life, and yet it hardly felt that way to me. It's not that I saw myself at a crossroads and worried about which way I would go. I knew from the first that I'd have to decline their invitation. All sororities require their pledges to dress in the sorority colors for a month and do other weird things besides. I didn't command the personal wealth to buy a month's worth of green and yellow clothing for pledging, nor could I visualize asking Seal for the money. I was the one who hadn't been allowed to join the brownies because they wore uniforms. Too militaristic. And even I could tell the difference between the brownies and Sigma Sigma. <laughs> Seal never would have gone for it. If somehow I had been able to collect the requisite number of garments, there remained the question of what I would have done when I actually got in. Friday night movies and pizza were mandatory social activities for a sorority sister, and there was no money for that either. So, reluctantly, but perhaps not that reluctantly, I opted to stick to black rather than scrape together the funds to go conformist in green and yellow. You could say that I was gradually realizing that perhaps it suited me better to be a marginal nerd. I can hardly tell now which came first, the clothing choices I started making in high school or the person I was becoming inside those clothes. It's not as if I always had a spiritual gyroscope inside, leaning constantly to the left. No, often I made important decisions about who to become based on the lack of something, or just plain laziness, or my cockeyed attempts to make do with what I was given. Looking back, I sometimes see myself as living proof that clothes do make the woman. In the middle of my junior year at Forest Hills High School, just as I had made the staff of the paper and started to have friends among the substrata of nerds who worked like me in the honors classes and the literary magazine, my family moved to a suburb of Washington, D.C. Before I left New York, Debbie, Peg, and some of my other girlfriends gave me a surprise party. My farewell gifts were a turquoise sweater that looked exactly like cashmere, but was a new, much cheaper substance called nylon, <laughs> and a gold heart with pearls in it. As my farewell present to them, I took Debbie and Peg to see Look Homeward Angel with Tony Perkins. I wore the sweater and the heart. I felt almost perfect. I was very, very sad to be leaving New York but dressed in my shiny gifts. For an afternoon, my spiritual gyroscope easily inclined itself toward a more mainstream sartorial image. Perhaps 
in this strange new world awaiting me in Washington, D.C., I, too, could be one of the popular people. Did you get to do yeah. some black down in Washington? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> read on, we'll find out. But you know. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you know, read on, or did you read black? High schools. This is a whole new. That's not a whole new thing. For me, it's. I mean, I never heard that they were in high school. Yeah. There, when what? did they that there were sororities? I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. Wow. They were in the high school. Awful. I eventually went to, but my father and others were very involved in getting them out before I got there. There's no high schools, schools have sororities now. No. Right? They just bumped them up to college and now they're bumping yeah. them out, right? Right. right. Hey. Yes, now all the colleges <laughs> have to try something to make you even more miserable. Yeah. Oh. 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 What did they do? <laughs> <laughs> what did they do? What did they do? What did they do? They did movies, right? And, 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 and they met the every Friday night. So it was like a built-in, you had a built-in social life, social life which consisted of your sorority sisters. But did, they didn't haze you and stuff. Well, no. yeah, you did. I had to go through a pledge thing where you did thing, wear initiations. And you had to wear those clothes. I mean, you wouldn't know. Have a little girl? Did they have a little girl? Sororities? Uh, I, I taught in New York City High School, so... When? Yeah, uh, in the uh, in the sixties, late sixties, uh -huh. seventies. Yeah, yeah I think well, this there, was the late fifties. This was the late fifties, oh, and the, mm -hmm. I don't think they, they were a big time thing, but yeah, uh, they were there. Yeah, they well, in my day too, but it was later on. Yeah, than when you went, but they still had them. Yeah, my day was a big thing. Actually, <laughs> most <laughs> most people joined them. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wow. That's yeah. How did they react when you turned them down? I I have absolutely no memory. I just like ah, waiter for you. <laughs> Were your your communist family in favor of sororities? Oh, no. I didn't even say a word to my parents. You know, my mother would have had a fifth. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, of course they weren't in favor. <laughs> well, if I had come and said to them, I need, you know, I need four pairs of four green skirts and three yellow sweaters, they would have said, you what? what? <laughs> I loved your gym stories because I went to school in New York City High School, but it was during the 60s I was in high school, so we was during the revolution. We tormented our gym teachers. So, like, I don't remember, we wore shorts and shirts and... One day, we all the girls came out. We tied our shirts up, leaving our midriff. We <laughs> wrote his name with eyebrow pencil across. And then we always had our periods. <laughs> oh, I have my period, Mr. Whatever his name was. And it was like, he was much too embarrassed. Like we, we were just right up there in his face about getting our periods, which came at least every week, if not more often. And that, you could get excused. And sure, think, sure fire away. I think finally, I think finally he caught on that, you know, girls, teenage girls did not have their periods every other day. <laughs> he was so embarrassed. <laughs> Well, I have them here. I'll sign them for oh, you yeah. if you want, and then you can pay me on your, your, uh, your parents, uh, your mother must have been very courageous. I mean, this is not long after your coffee, is it? Before. That's not long after. It's in the middle yeah. of well, uh, the middle. Yeah, I thought it was in the middle uh, middle later, yeah. but she was doing this, but uh, she had to have a lot of courage to uh, mm. join that. Well, she, had, she was a timid yeah, person in many ways. Sure. So, you know, they put all the communist books in the closet, and I was instructed not to say one word about them. But, you know, on the other hand, they, they still did it. Had they joined in the 30s? Yeah. And they didn't, too? And they didn't, went to school with the they didn't go against him. Little Red School. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I was never able to discuss any of this with them because they would not talk about it. Okay. Ever. Mm -hmm. They didn't even say it out loud. But did they go oh, to Communist Party meetings? I believe they, they did. I believe they did. In your childhood that you knew yeah, it. It's like more like the 30s. So. Yeah. No, in my childhood. Yeah. 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 I believe they did. I did not know about it. Oh, I know. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Oh, my. He sure survived. My other well, grandparents were calling Very well. <laughs> <laughs> well, humor is the best revenge. Isn't oh, isn't it, though? <laughs> my God. Their granddaughter is now running the organization to help get, you know, get funds for children. They went to my high school yeah, in Merville. Yeah. Oh. The boys did, yeah. Yeah, we knew them. Right. All of them. Yeah. And they're was still it, working. It, like was it Yip Harbor or children of raised as a Rosenberg's in children prison. Uh, in prison. Uh, or it was someone like that. No, it was the guy who wrote The House I Live In. I thought it was you. So Phyllis, um, Bianca. Mm -hmm. Bianca, okay. I'm signing the books, but Bianca. So okay. Hey, Bianca. Yeah. No, I'm not taking anything. I'm going to look at this. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. It's that communist background. <laughs> no, it's because Bianca's selling. No. You know, I, that's true. Okay. <laughs>